We're back. Uh, another edition of Kevin's Corner here as we begin the month of April. We'll get into some off-season program, uh, scheduling stuff. You know, the draft is three weeks from tomorrow, which is kind of crazy to think about as we record this here on Wednesday, April 3rd. And obviously the Julian Blackman news item um, we'll certainly hit on here, and that'll be the chunk of today's podcast. But uh, certainly I've got to start with just the tragic news of the week for the Colts, and that is the passing at an age is just shocking to read. Um, at the age of 35, Vontae Davis uh, found dead. And as we record this, um, still no cause of death announced for Vontae. Eddie, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll probably just start sharing some thoughts about Vontae Davis. And, you know, what I remember about Vontae, the person, is, you know, the Colts have remodeled their locker room since, but it was in their old locker room. I would say more than anybody, Vontae was in that locker room during the open media availability every single day. That back right corner, I can see him right there. Back right corner, um, you know, eating out of his styrofoam lunch to go that he would take from the cafeteria and bring back in the locker room. And I would say several days a week, you'd go back there and you know, whatever, he'd have a big wide receiver matchup and I'd think about chatting with him for a couple minutes and you start to get closer to him, and you hear this voice that's not his, uh, and it's Grandma on the other line. He's chatting with Grandma. He's filling her in on what the day is like and, you know, just checking in with her. And, you know, there's such a genuine nature, clearly, to that relationship. It was really beautiful to see. And then as a player, I think I've said it before in this podcast, but in my opinion, he was the best player on that Colts football team in 2014. Um it was incredible what he did. You know, they got to that AFC title game largely because of their defense. And you know, stifling a Cincinnati team that was not super explosive, but you know, that performance by um Vontae against Denver, it's one of the greater individual performances in Colts history. Five passes defensed in that game, five passes broken up. So he was challenged. Peyton Manning challenged him with Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders and that crew. And, and I don't think people realize the NFL record for passes broken up in a game is seven. And that's only been done once. Vonta had five in the biggest win this franchise has had. I mean, hell, you got to go back a long, long time on the road at Denver against Peyton. It was remarkable. I'll never forget he got banged up late in the first half. And I'm sitting there waiting for the Colts to come out at mile high for the second half. And it was one of those where he played so well in the first half and had been playing so well, I've got the binoculars out glued to the visiting tunnel. When's Vontae coming out? When's he coming out? How's he going to look? And sure enough, he did come back out and, again, was a massive, massive reason why the Colts advanced the AFC title game. I think a lot of people remember that you know crazy long stat he had of not allowing a touchdown in coverage. So... Um, you know, certainly a talent. You know, unfortunately, had to go through a whole lot in his life, and clearly, he's been dealing with some stuff here in recent years. Um, you know, we all saw, you know, how it ended in Buffalo. You know, that I know a lot of people joked about that stuff, but you know, obviously, he was dealing with something for him to abruptly retire like that during the middle of a game. Um, so, certainly, thinking about Vontae's grandmother, uh, Vernon, and just his entire family. Yeah, I certainly remember watching him um, come over from the Dolphins uh, and being one of the best cornerbacks, really, the Colts have had in their franchise history. Yeah, like, when you think I, I don't about think it. that's hyperbole at all. And again, we've talked about this with the corner need for the Colts, you know, the multi-year. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I think he was a back-to-back pro bowler in 14 and 15. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he gave you several years of really elite cornerback play. And, you know, I'm sitting there on Monday when the news breaks and, you know, you you see the tweets from Chuck Pagano and T.Y. Hilton and Reggie Wayne and, you know, they all were, you know, very enlightening. But I sat there and I'm like, you know what? I'd love to hear from Ryan Grigson, you know, because when you think about it, Grigson makes that trade. You know, Vontae was in a way, it was kind of like Nick Cross, you know, he was drafted very young coming out. Of Illinois, and I think there were some questions from a maturity standpoint with that age, and clearly it did not work out in Miami. Um, and I know Ryan; he can get really 
introspective, which I appreciate, you know, when he is asked questions like that. So I reached out to Ryan and told him, hey, um, you care to comment and you care if I share that comment. And he sent me back this and I'll share it with you now. Uh, Ryan Grigson, quote, as a person, Vontae was as fun loving of a guy you could ever be around. As a player, he was a total package, a physical specimen that was elite in man coverage, but also one of the hardest-hitting cornerbacks I have ever seen. We made the trade because we knew he could really impact us early in our transition and knew he was a good person that could thrive in new surroundings. He did not disappoint. Vontae overcame more obstacles in life than most will ever face. He's gone way too early. Heartbreaking news. So again, that from the Colts GM who executed that trade and certainly was a great trade that worked out very, very well for the Colts. Um, So just tragic. I mean, you think about, I mean, certainly the Edwin Jackson news and, you know, you go back to Zerlon Tipton and now this with Vontae, um, just wild to think, um, you know, several of those guys from, you know, the best Colts team we've seen in quite some time gone at such young young ages so again um, thoughts with everybody in the Davis family and you know his players and his teammates and um, you know his former coaches and all those impacted by this a no easy transition from there but we will move on to the biggest Colts news item um, on the field probably in several weeks and that would be Julian Blackman the re-signing of the safety um, you know, Eddie, clearly Julian Blackman wanted to test the market. And we talked about it leading into free agency. That safety market was going to look different. It was not going to be as robust as maybe some guys thought it would be. Uh, contractually, you look at it, you know, a lot of these deals are of multi year length. Julian's is not. Julian's just a one year deal, reportedly $3.2 million guaranteed, incentive laden deal that could rise to north of $7 million. If you look at that, how that compares to other safeties, I mean, that's probably about a mid range. Um, like 15-ish safety in the league, which I think kind of checks out for Blackman. Again, I think listeners will know I'm a huge Julian Blackman fan. You can't ignore the injuries, but it is kind of it is kind of weird, I guess, in a way, Eddie. You look at his career, he's missed 50 of 67 games. Excuse me, he's played in 50 of 67 games. That torn Achilles in his second season, I believe, that was obviously the big injury. He came off the torn ACL in the Pac-12 title game his final year at Utah. He also has played over 90% of the snaps in three or four years. So, I mean, that is a nice track record there. Um, again, you can't just totally ignore the injuries, but it's not like he's been incredibly oft injured or has missed whatever, five, six games on an annual basis. That has not been the case here. You know, he made the switch to strong safety, career year for him last season, um, you know, career high in tackles and passes broken up and interceptions and tackles for loss, and he's just so trustworthy. He's versatile. Uh, he's a great communicator, um, much needed in a, in a room that has a lot of inexperience and a lot of unproven nature to it all. So I'd say my grand takeaway is this on Blackman. I like the fact that he's brought back. I like the fact that it's a one-year deal, so he'll continue to be highly motivated to want to prove himself. Uh, But you're missing one other move that's needed in that secondary. And I would say one other veteran move. Um, I'll go back to the Joel A. Erickson comment that I thought was brilliant in describing the secondary for this offseason. You need to raise the floor. You know, if you draft a guy, you're certainly raising the ceiling. But even if you draft whatever, Quinion Mitchell at 15 or Terry and Arnold at 15, you know, there's still some doubt. There's still some indecision on that instant impact you're going to get. Um, a veteran move can help you stabilize things, keep the ship afloat a bit. Uh, that's the question that I would have for this group right now. I was um, trying to remember on my drive into work, who was the player? Was it Justin Houston? That the Colts coveted and wanted him to return, but he wanted to wait and feel out the market because, or well, Ballard wanted to wait and have him realize that his value wasn't as sought after um, as he thought it was. I, I can't remember if it was Houston or if it was somebody else. It was one of the early years. Sounds right. And his um, uh, tenure as the general manager. Yeah. 
that that's uh, and again, you know, Ballard has played this game. See what out see what is out there on on, on the market, but we still want to bring you back. Mm-hmm. You know, Ballard has played that game, and again, I think the safety value has really played into this. I think a couple other items of note on Blackman, one specifically with him. Eddie, I go back to Gus Bradley, one of his first press conferences, and was just kind of asked about, you know, what do you know about the personnel on this team, on this defense? He goes, you know, it's funny you say that. I reached out to Philip Rivers. Gus and Philip had a connection from the Charger days. Mm-hmm. And he asked Philip, hey, man, what were your impressions of this defense? And, you know, Philip was just one year, it was that 2020 season. But the first name that Philip said, to Gus Bradley was Julian Blackman. And think about that, Eddie. That's the 2020 COVID year where Blackman had a torn ACL coming off that of the Pac-12 title game, hardly participating in the offseason program. And that's the guy that impressed him the most out of anybody else on that defense. I was always struck by that. Um, I've shared the story before, but anybody that went out to training camp last year at Grand Park, Julian Blackman was sidelined you know, for a big chunk of it with a hamstring injury. I mean, he was so vocal. On that sideline, you can tell his communication is just a huge, huge factor in the type of player that he is. Again, played some corner at Utah. Obviously, he's played the other safety spot. Um, I do think, assuming he stays a strong safety, that free safety needs a lot of attention. Are you really going to have Nick Cross and Rodney Thomas battle it out? I know some people have mentioned Daniel Scott, the rookie out of Cal from last year. I mean, tore his ACL in May. You know, projecting him to a guy that's never played, I think, is. A bit premature. And, you know, I, I said it yesterday in my tweet. Like, you see moves like this, and you'll either see people like, here we go, team, run it back. This is stupid. Or the counter to that, you know, will be, you know, boy, what a brilliant move, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, Blackman is exactly the guy that you need. This sure's up your, your, your secondary. I'm like, well, I, I think you can label both here. I think you can say Julian Blackman, popping the week 18 film against the Texans was important to bring back, but you can also sit here and say, that can't be it. Mm-hmm. Something else is needed in the secondary. I said at the start of the offseason, I want three veteran moves in the secondary. Well, one could be Kenny, resign. Two could be Julian, resign. Where's the third? You know, it, Do we see a Rodney McLeod April signing like we've seen before? Um, let me go back to Chris Bauer's comments at the end of the season. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said, you know, I failed Gus Bradley. I mean, I asked him very specifically, why 28th allowed in points back-to-back seasons? And what did Ballard do? He carried the brunt of it. He admitted failings, however you want to look at it. And so now, Eddie, I transition towards the draft, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, if they go defense heavy, what have you done to support Anthony Richardson this offseason? Then if they go offense heavy, Ballard's comments from the end of the year of I failed Gus Bradley, you've given him Raekwon Davis. So that's where I am just confused by this aspect to it all. Again, I think Julian Blackman is an important piece. When healthy, he's extremely reliable for you and trustworthy, but I just hate forcing needs in the draft. And I think kind of that's where you're at uh, coming up here three weeks from uh, from tomorrow. Anything else on Blackman? I was about to say, he only took, was it just the one visit to Buffalo, or did he take another visit? San Francisco. I couldn't well. remember if he took one there or not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it didn't seem like the market was rather large for him in terms of visits like that. Of well, I mean, it was the market large for any safety, you know? That's true. It's a group that had a lot of names and, and still does have a few names out there um you know a little bit more maybe from the marquee front um so again I, I i like a lot of what julian blackman brings but man you talk about indispensable colts i mean on paper <laughs> he's got to be close to the top and kenny moore would rank as well um so it's a lot of betting on in-house development here for the Colts and just you know it doesn't look like it's going to happen but you know avenues to create cap space you know a restructure of DeForest Buckner a restructure of Quentin Nelson a you know the Mo Alley Cox decision seems like he's going to be back you know that's a lot of money to pay for the type of production that you've gotten from him Um, if the Colts operate in a normal financial state Eddie nothing is happening significantly the rest of the offseason 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's how they they just typically operate uh, with where their cap space is at right now. So remember our green, yellow, red exercise we did. Perfect, right? Six for six on the green, two for four on the yellow. Again, yellow. I could be talked into either um, Danny Pinter and Jannard Avery back, Gardner Minshew, Zach Moss gone, and then the only red to return was Taven Bryant, if you look out of that group. So Colts are replacing four free agents, Gardner Minshew, Zach Moss, Isaiah McKenzie, and Jake Martin. Those are the four departures. I mean, this is it. It's very rare. Today is three weeks into free agency of the new league year. They're done. That list of over a dozen guys is is complete. Four have moved on. Uh, six have been or eight have been brought back. You know, all of that is wipe your hands of that. So all the in house guys accounted for for next season. I know we have a couple of defensive back questions and the Twitter questions, but. Want to examine the available free agents right now because outside corner is still a strong need, as you have mentioned, uh, pod after pod after pod again. You look at the names that are still out there: Xavier Howard, J.C. Jackson, Adoree Jackson. Uh, obviously, not Cameron Sutton with everything that's going on with him right now. Stephon Gilmore, Micah Hyde, more of a strong safety. Avante Maddox, Patrick Peterson, Stephen Nelson, Levi Wallace, Rocky Seen. Uh, any of those names tickle your fancy? No. Um, that's quite the way to to word it. Um, Stephen Nelson, I thought had a nice year in Houston. Um, you know, I I think the key thing to remember with 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 that sort of list, Eddie, is you know an outside corner, and not you know necessarily a slot guy. When you look at that group, um, you know Henderson kind of falls into the category of. Hey, here's the former top. What was he? Was he top ten, top fifteen pick? Mm-hmm. Do you kick the tires on that? I mean, I I wouldn't mind seeing. I thought Gilmore had some moments with Dallas, but you know, Ballard would probably counter and say, "Well, you're going to stun a young guy's growth." And I I just think there's a fine balance in how you operate there. So those are probably the two that come to mind the most of anybody on that list. And, and, you know, we'll see if we get veteran cuts, you know, whether it was Rodney McLeod, whether it was, I mean, even Nick Foles I'm trying to think, I think Trey Burton might've been an April or May signing. You know, sometimes you get through the draft mm-hmm. teams draft heavy at that position. Then they make a cut after I forgot about him or a day three trade. You know, is that something that you would explore? But I just think you got to go out and find some outside corner. And honestly, I mean, you might need another veteran safety. I mean, it's a lot of eggs in the Nick Cross and Rodney Thomas basket. And then who do you trust more out of those two? Right. You know, Cross is the budding potential. He's the young dude that, you know, didn't play as much at, you know, in college, of course, as Rodney did at Yale. But then Rodney's got all the NFL experience compared to Nick Cross. And then in the biggest moment of the season last year, you opted for Ronnie Harrison to play safety in that week 17, 18 game once Blackman got hurt. Man, you been healthy Julian Blackman, you're in the playoffs. If you have nothing else to add, you ready for Twitter questions? Yes. Only four to get to today. Colton is up first. Now that the Colts have re-signed Julian Blackman, do you think the Colts are going to roll with Nick Cross? I do think Chris Bauer is higher on him than maybe what the coaching staff has indicated with playing time. Now, is that because he's more invested? I, it's a fair question, fair thought. I, I'd like to think. <laughs> Ballard doesn't operate in that manner. Um, but again, it's it's probably a fair point to bring up. I just I don't love the here you go, cross Rodney Thomas, battle it out to be our last line of defense in a starting battle. Yeah. You know, the Colts play a lot of single high stuff. And you know, I, I will continue to say it and we'll hit it when the draft is released or when the schedule is released here coming up. In a little over a month, but Eddie, remember, 10 of 17 quarterbacks you faced last year, backups or rookies. And if you look at the opponents so far here for 2024, you know, it is a Jordan Love. It is C.J. Stroud twice. It is Trevor Lawrence. It is Josh Allen. It is Tua. 
you know, Jared Goff is certainly a veteran. We'll see about the health of Aaron Rodgers. Um, I mean, that is a pretty notable quarterback list, certainly much better than you faced last season. And for that single high safety spot to look like a position battle between those two, um, I'd like to see one more veteran added to that mix. Kind of like the Mike Mitchell of the room or the... um... Yeah, Mike Adams, if you want to go back even further. That was the name I was about to pull from the hat there. That is is a really good point. Uh, Next up is... Creighton, hopefully uh, you didn't bet on the Blue Jays. I had the Blue Jays in the Elite Eight. Can't say that I blame you, but uh, they just got good make shots. Purdue, Arizona was my title game with Purdue winning, obviously. One looks decent, the other looks horrific. How about yourself? I had, um, I made two brackets. One was Purdue and UConn. The other was Purdue and North Carolina. Got it. So you are boiler heavy there. Yeah. I didn't think there was a strong team on that side of the bracket. Yeah, I personally. feel bad for Jamal Shedd going down for Houston. I mean, yeah. you want to talk about Purdue, things breaking their way. I mean, Purdue's had the same starting lineup all year long. I know. Just one turn of the ankle, and Houston, I mean, Houston lost that game by three. Yeah. I mean, they they easily could have been playing, you know, Purdue Saturday night. But and They've been healthy, like, all season outside of the Braden Smith. Right. Big Don't need to remind Purdue injury. fans what injuries can mean, though. Right. Uh, anyway, Creighton's Twitter question is up next. Have you heard anything on the Colts going after any defensive backs, whether it be a corner or a safety and free agency still? I would like to think the Colts at least need one of each before the draft. I think one thing to keep in mind, too, as we get to April, Eddie, is like, are we in the both sides wanting to wait with the free agent front? And obviously, you just saw the black news, but like, you're starting to get close to the draft, so... If you're a free agent, you might think to yourself, hey, if this team doesn't draft the position that I play, they might be more desperate to then sign me after the draft, or vice versa. <laughs> they might draft the position that I play, and now they might not want to draft me. Um, but, you know, again, I brought up you know, earlier, Rodney McLeod and Trey Burton and Nick Foles, I think, was the May signing. Eric Fisher, remember that? They get through the draft, and they, mm-hmm. they sign Eric Fisher there. So I do think that's always something when the calendar gets to April. You know, the comp pick formula, I think, goes away. Uh, the signings don't count against your comp pick formula, I think, right after the draft, if I remember correctly. So that probably is a factor as well. But I know the Colts have definitely, you know, looked into... Honestly, I, I've probably heard more safety than corner. Um, that's that's probably where I've been. And, you know, of course, the, you know, this is prior to the Julian Blackman signing. So I think they need to do one more. Of note there. I do. I guess I can't count. We had five Twitter questions today, not four. So there's three left. Will, KB, am I wrong to wish for the Colts to act like the Bears? They've made two trades uh, for wideouts and still may draft an elite pass catcher in the first round. They are not saying Caleb Williams is just going to be the difference. They are saying in order for this young player to make a difference, we must surround him with playmakers to give him a chance. We'll love to hear your thoughts on the Bears situation. Obviously, the Bears and Colts are a bit different, but you catch my drift. I know it's not exactly comparing apples to apples. Can I make the baby analogy for the second straight week? Ooh, let's see if you can. You remember how you phrased it? No, I thought it was one of my... It's one of the few times I've ever thought of an analogy in my head. I'm like, oh, actually, I think it sounds decently well. Jake Query would have been proud of you for it. Yeah, may- maybe maybe it's not. Um, Oversupport. Like, and, and it, two things probably pop into my head, Eddie, about it. You should oversupport, and you can oversupport. You should and you can. And that's not always the case. You know, sometimes... You should or you want to do something, but you can't. You don't have the resources to do it. But the Colts are in a boat like Chicago and like these other AFC South teams that they are in a position to do that. So that's where some of my disagreement comes of just like, man, you know, you're not given. It's a little bit of like, hey, no training wheels. There's the bike. Figure it out. Could work. Could fall a couple times and then really it could work or it you know could be pretty demoralizing. So um, that's where 
I would disagree with this. Again, the baby analogy from last week of, you know, you're throwing everything in that baby bag. You're going to your favorite restaurant. You really want your kid to behave. You really want to have a nice dinner. You might want to have two beers instead of one. If you want to stay for that second beer, you better hope you've got the teething cracker and and the book and the passy. You might need a you might need a little iPad action. You might need some fruit snacks. You might need three pouches instead of two. Uh, empty the bag by all costs. Sometimes Maddie looks at me and goes, "Are we really packing all that?" You never know. We're heading into battle. I say to her, "Wait a second. You're more of a woman in that regard than she is." Uh yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think she would admit this. I usually get the last laugh. You know, she'll really? look at me and she'll be like, gosh, I'd like another drink. And I'm like, have you seen how our children are acting right now? And she's like, yeah, you're right. And then it's like, well, I'll just give them my phone. Well, maybe if we would have packed a little more, we wouldn't be in this DEF CON situation. It's a good thing she doesn't listen to the pod. Well, I, I think she would agree with that. I mean, she's literally the greatest mother in the world. I, I don't need to preface that and is an incredible in what uh, Rosie and Max need at all times. But I would say I'm more of the heavy packer than her. And again, why not? What's the worst thing? I'm just pushing a little bit more of a stroller? It's a good workout. That's how I view it. (laughs) You never know what you're going to dig for and what you're going to find. And that's the equally frustrating part of it all. So there's there's the baby analogy. I don't know if that was as fluid as last week's, but just over support. And I'll go back to that, Eddie. You should and you can. In three or four years... That can part might be a can't. You can't support as much as you would like. You can do it right now. You can try some things. That, to me, is something that needs to be explored. Two Twitter questions left. Ryan and Jason, we will start with Ryan. With the Colts not giving up a third rounder for Legereus Sneed, is there any hope of a chance they could be planning a move for Marvin Harrison Jr.? Hear me out. I know it's far from Chris Ballard's style, but the seat is getting a little hot in year number eight. Jim Irsay is an eccentric billionaire owner who puts so much value on nostalgia and he knows getting the son of a Colts legend would win over the entire city. Irsay wants to be loved and wants to be a rock star. This would be a rock star move. Personally, I'm getting a little tired of, quote, depth of value I want to pair our rookie quarterback with a potential superstar wide receiver for the next five years. Don't you love fans? Yeah, and I and I appreciate it. And obviously, Jim Mersey, you know, made a comment to Mike Chappell, I guess, kind of jokingly about it. I think Jim Mersey didn't he make another comment to about Bryce Young, right? Yes, last year, correct. Old opening press conference of Shane Steichen. Again, two-way street. You know, why is the team going to trade down? And, you know, if you listen to some of these draft pundits, Eddie, I think a lot of people view this wide receiver class a little bit more jumbled together than just Marvin Harrison Jr. absolutely dwarfing, you know, the Malik Neighbors and the Roma Dunzes and some of these others in this class there. So I, I just, as much as I love the support idea, um, I think that there are some other swings that need to be taken in this draft at other spots as well and again there's an element of relying on the wide receiver draft and you know Eddie you can look at some of these past drafts and look where some of these guys have drafted have been drafted they were not the number one wideout I mean sure you've got a Jamar Chase but like you know where what number wideout was Justin Jefferson in his draft class what number wideout was AJ Brown what mm-hmm. number wideout was Debo Samuel what number wideout was DK Metcalf and remember the Colts and I agree with this. They have they view themselves of having a specific need at wide out of we need a yard after catch guy. That comes in all different body types. Comes in all different shapes and sizes. And that player might not be a dominant slot guy or a great outside the numbers wide out. But fits that criteria of what you're looking for. So um yeah, I mean the cost would be again incredible to move up that high. Two-way street element to it. I would say no. I know some people may not be on Twitter slash X or as active as some of us, like uh, yourself and my, and me. When you look at the places the Colts have been with Reggie Wayne and, you know, just executives in general, seems to me like they're honing in on Xavier Worthy out of Texas. 
Yeah, a lot of attention to visiting with him. Yes. Uh, Reggie Wayne was at the Texas Pro Day. I think um, Jim Bach Cooter may, might have been there as well. He's coming in or has come in with a top 30 visit. They met with him informally and formally at the Combine. So it seems like that's somebody they're intrigued in. I know that um, Reggie Wayne has been to Oregon for Troy Franklin. He was at um, Western Kentucky. Is that right for Malachi Corley? Um, and there was there was another school that I'm forgetting about. Ohio State. Um, yeah, th- there's a, and this isn't like shocking news, but there's a heavy speed element to those guys. Um, and again, to me, that yards after catch element, that's what kind of makes sense here with where you're at for the Colts. LSU is the other school I was thinking of. Uh, final Twitter question. Any wideouts is- down there? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> uh, Jason has the final Twitter question. With the emergency quarterback rule change, there's no reason to keep three quarterbacks on the active roster, correct? I guess unless you really want to protect that third guy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the rule change is what? And you can call up a practice squad QB to be your third quarterback on game day? And it doesn't – does it not count towards your roster – yeah, I mean, obviously, you wouldn't be a fifty-three man roster guy. Um, and there, you can do an unlimited. There's not. A, yeah, I, I believe amount of times you can yeah, do it now. I'd have to double check that. But again, if you're on the practice squad, you still aren't safe week in and week out. Right. You know, other teams can obviously sign you. Yeah, financially, it'll be interesting to see what that looks like as well. Um, so yeah, those will be. That was probably one of the more under the radar rule changes that we did see. From the Colts last week. Um, anything else from you, Eddie Garrison? Are you glad the Bachelor is finally over? Um, actually, semi enjoyed it on on Monday nights. More would, just the entertainment of you enjoyed it. Joey this season. Well, I struggle with the names. Uh, actually, uh, I I did like him. Um, Joey's the main guy that seemed normal. Yes. Yeah, I thought there was less drama than normal this year. Correct. Yeah. He just seemed like a cool dude. Yeah, he seemed pretty down to earth. Um, so, yeah, now I'm watching Full Swing on Netflix. And I also want to watch the Dan Weldon Lionheart. Have you watched that yet? No. What's that on? I think it's on HBO. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm fans, certainly local fans and fans of racing, the, the tragic death of Dan Weldon in Las Vegas over a decade ago, and his sons now to the age where they're really getting into motorsports and um, yeah, I, I've heard it's outstanding. Lionheart, uh, the nickname used for him. Um, now, Maddie's not into Grey's Anatomy, is she? No. I was about no. to say, just got renewed for a 21st season. So Really? Wow. Yeah. That's survivor efforts there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a big brother. No, we're not on that on the Bowen household. Um, okay, week from Monday, off-season program, April 15th. I did find it interesting, only six OTAs for the Colts this year. They could have 10. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I would think of the 90 man roster. You could kind of fluctuate, you know, hey, this might be a heavy Anthony Richardson day. Then the next day, hey, let's let Flacco, whatever, get some work if you're worried about Richardson's arm, you know, day after day. Usually, teams, the Colts have gone with three straight weeks of those 10 OTAs, you know, three one week, three the next, four the last week, and then a three day mini camp. And this year, the Colts are eliminating an entire week of those OTAs. So, yeah, I'm not going to like overly read too much into it, but. It just kind of falls in line, I guess, with a little bit of Shane Steichen last year of, you know, how many Wednesday walkthroughs did we see from the Colts late in the season? That was a very popular theme from then. So dialing it back a bit here in the spring. And again, it's not like you're installing new offenses or anything, but I still think getting as many reps as possible for Anthony Richardson would be well served, even if he's not necessarily chucking it 20, 30 times on those OTA Day. So more to that as we get closer to the offseason program, and we got to start diving deeper into the draft, Eddie. Three Let's weeks go. From tomorrow. He is Eddie Garrison. I am Kevin Bowen. Everybody have a great, great week. We'll talk to you next week. We'll talk to you next week.